just uh, for the, those of you that have always been on, uh, Al Ramsey is on today from Massachusetts, basically involved in minor hockey. He's an Islander, uh, knows Al Andrews, and, and uh, he's doing some great minor hockey wor uh, work. And uh, all of you have received the video I put together of uh, NHL players on the bench with an iPad, and I preceded it with a photo of Al Ramsey's novice kids with iPads on the bench. And, and it's really uh, looking forward to next week at 10 o'clock Calgary time. Brad McKenzie, who's been picked up on this, gosh, it must have been 15 years ago in Veramaki, the idea of... Uh, players coaching themselves to a degree um, he's going to be speaking on that at 10 o'clock on December 3rd for for all of you and um, you know I'm I'm good to start at 8 30 we can delay it a half hour so we can keep people on longer if you wish but we'll touch base with everybody on the Skype, Skype email list so just wanted to give you a heads up there uh, welcome Dominic um, How's things in your hockey world in Stockton, California? Are you still a a member of the Flames coaching staff and the Stockton staff? Yeah, I am. We uh, we just had a meeting actually yesterday, just talking. Uh, you know, we were just going through our kind of systems and how we were going to approach it and being able to uh, you know mimic that of what they're trying to do in Calgary. So yeah, no, very much so, and. Um, yeah, just still kind of piecing through, uh, <clears throat> you know, a St. Mary's prep school program, trying to trying to figure that how that would look, and uh, also with the uh, Sharks, um, the San Jose Junior Sharks girls program, um, going to start with them the beginning of uh, December and kind of some coach mentoring, um, just getting on the ice with them as well. So busy time. Uh, I used to go to town to horse and wagon, and now I'm talking to people all over the world on Skype. It's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> it's a, somewhere along the line, it was a culture shock. <laughs> Must be in the 50s. <laughs> well, Alan, you and I are the same. We're staying alive trying to figure this technology out, and... <clears throat> Kim, in last week's presentation, uh, and Tom was on, and uh, I, I think a few other people were, but we hung on till the dying end of the call. But Kim went into things on how she team builds using Zoom and how she uses uh, video analysis on, uh, on Zoom as well. And she's way ahead of all of us, I'm sure, in that regard. So... Looking forward to catching up with the technology. And I've always had this question in the back of my mind when we're, we're sort of dealing with things at our level of thought. And I'm just wondering, Mr. Barrett, what do you think about it all? Are, are we off the wall here? Or is there a sense of correct direction for hockey coaching in this pursuit of madness that we're in? <laughs> I don't think it's a pursuit of madness. Um... I appreciate you asking my opinion. Uh, I think in a lot of things, the pendulum can go too far in one direction when when we start to think differently. So I think there's, there's a middle ground to this. And I know I've heard some of you talking about letting the players learn on their own. And then there's some references made to what I brought up, which is this Socratic approach we use at Ivy. Um, I think... There's a need to um, evolve the way we're to coaching, and the, especially are finding different ways to learn. But I don't think just letting them off on their own to figure things out is the right way. There has to be some some judgment and wisdom in them applied to guide them in their thinking uh, without telling them the answer. Uh, and I think if anything, what we do at Ivy, that's how we teach, is not telling the answer, but certainly not leaving the students just to go randomly wherever they want to. 
we put up some guardrails and make sure that they're being directed appropriately or at least put some parameters around how they think so that they eventually can um, learn themselves but not just <coughs> randomly anywhere they want to go. So I don't think I think I don't think we're mad at what we're doing. It's just a question of um, how far do we go from being very prescriptive in what we do to allowing them to do to learn on their own. Yeah. So no, I don't think it's crazy at all. Uh, and I think I, I would I would I would ascertain that most of us have applied some of this ourselves when we coached. I certainly had a coach. My my most impactful coach when I played in college was someone who coached this way anyway. There was just no labeling on it at the time. Yeah. I, I think I, I really like what you said. Like, I think the foundation has to be laid and the, prom, the parameters have to be there for sure. But within that, there's, there can be a lot of self-learning take place rather than just spoon feeding. And, and, Absolutely. Uh, and uh, so I think that, that with all these different ideas, when we, when we look at the best of everything, we might come up with something really good for, for coaching generally. And, and actually what we're being challenged with now, Alan, is what we call asynchronous learning versus synchronous learning. And not to get too um, uh, granular on that kind of stuff, but basically it's we put a lot of information on, because we're teaching through Zoom now, we put a lot of information on the internet for the students to do their learning on their own by themselves. That's the asynchronous stuff. And then when we come into a Zoom call where we're having a conversation like we're having now, it's more synchronous. And we're having to figure out how to change the way we teach to make sure that we still get the proper learning objectives and outcomes from what we're doing out there. But it's, it's, it's a challenge. And um, I think our younger students learn differently than we learned because they, they're growing up in a much more technological, digital environment and are much more comfortable with learning on their own. When we learned on our own, I don't know about you guys, I'd watch Hockey Night in Canada and watch how he played and try to model some of the things he did that I took in myself. And my dad was a professional soccer player, so he could talk to me about um, how to visualize a game conceptually. But then you would watch other players play hockey and just kind of model what they did and figure out if it worked for you or not. So, but kids today are learning, you know, in a different way and have greater tools at their disposal. And it's our job as coaches to make sure that we're utilizing them as best possible to let the players learn. Yeah, and I, and I think that's what's so exciting about, about Kim and Dominic and, and Al. Like, they're coming in with uh, different perspectives and, and different uh, techniques. And uh, I learned from, like, Kim, I've learned from you this morning, just listening to that short uh, message you gave so i can't wait to, to communicate with you one-on-one -on -one. so we'll chat soon I'll, I'll email you later to set it up okay <laughs> okay tim, tim bothwell you got a wave on i think yeah yeah i just i just had a thought like along these lines about because i you know i totally agree with what dave said that there's a middle ground um the socratic method and the self-learning is i think a really positive positive thing but i agree that the players uh would greatly benefit from you know some some direction or prodding or whatever um and i think we all agree on that but I, thinking all that um you know i'm i'm thinking about uh you know obviously thinking about the danish team in particular our team and um we we've done almost exclusively just uh positive video with them to this point, uh, after a year, like just showing them stuff we want, we want, we want, we like, we like. And, you know, I'm sort of struggling with um, sort of the other side of that equation. Like there's a lot to be learned from errors that that happen and, uh, you know, not wanting to um, make that a focus, of course. But uh, the question is this, and it just occurred to me. And I'd be really interested in the, the views in particular of, of those of us who have coached females, um, but obviously uh, in anybody. Um, I, I just had the thought that if we're showing our team a, a video clip and we want the players as we're talking to essentially run the meeting and make the observations and as a coach, I say really nothing. Uh, what if we gave the players the, the parameter to say, hey, Let's let's focus on the good things that we see. That's what we want to point out. 
But if you see yourself and yourself only uh, making an error, being out of position, or you have a question about whether your positioning is proper or not, then you're the only one that can bring up an error. And like, a, how would that go down with the females? Uh, would they be confident enough to, to ask the questions or point out, hey, I'm supposed to be here, but I'm not. And that's why this maybe bad thing happened. Um, what, do, what do we think? Oh, you know, Kim, you got your hand up. Like, what, what do we think? Could that work? Would that work? Or would it be counterproductive? Well, I mean, if you ask them what they screwed up on, you better be ready for a long meeting. Uh, so female athletes are very self-aware of what they screwed up on, and uh, they they will t they will be happily share their mistakes. They, that's my experience in the with fifteen to twenty year olds. Um, but they're okay with pointing it out. Uh, I would use that idea of them pointing out. You know, you guys just you, you play a garbage game. We've all done it. And uh, you don't want, you know, you're as a coach, you're like fuming, you want to show the video, it's be like a death march, so you don't show it. Um, but occasionally, uh, to your point, Tim, you know, you don't want to pretend it's all unicorns and rainbows. So what I've done sometimes with like, I don't want them to do negative video, I, I don't think that's great. And I'll get into that for a second. But if you play a, you know, a toilet bowl game, and everyone says, you know what, I screwed up there. Oh, man, I should have had my stick there, or whatever. And, and everyone takes a little ownership of it. So you go around the room and be like, who made a mistake? Everyone puts their hand up. What'd you do? Everyone says something. And then you put that positive spin on be like, okay, well, hockey's a game of mistakes. Ice is slippery. We all screwed up. No one was perfect today. You all just told me you all made at least one mistake. You might have made 20, right? And then so you, you use that as a way to like put the bad video to bed. Uh, I, personally, I teach, uh, if I'm going to teach from screw ups, I teach from the other team's screw ups. Um, or I allow them, uh, so in a self-guided way, say, okay, let's talk about all the things we did great with and without the puck, and let's talk about where the other team screwed up. So maybe you're watching their mistakes, you know, whether they're dictated by you or not, uh, but that's a way maybe to have them, you know, look at the game. I believe every video has two sets of video. There's your team and whatever the other team did, right? I'm not necessarily going to teach from the other team's highlights. But I might teach from their mistakes, and that might be a different way of doing it. So they're very comfortable sharing what they screwed up on, but you'll go down the rabbit hole really quickly because they'll just be like, oh, I suck at this, I sucked at this. And it's almost like, again, I, I'm projecting 15 to 20-year-olds, but it's almost like funny to them. It shouldn't be, but they're like, oh, look at me again, falling over. And like, so it's, an, it's a fine that they're kind of like jokey about it. But what I do know is they internalize it very poorly to see themselves like to obviously to have you pointed out would be bad have their teammate pointed out, out would be even more tragic um but i don't know that them saying oh i did this badly again if it was a horrible game and everybody did everything badly then i would use it that way but most of the time i wouldn't have them identify it in a group setting but what do they say you you praise uh publicly and criticize privately uh, you know, I might have individual video sessions or have them do an individual video. So you you show you have them watch that same video, Tim, and you say, okay, you have to pick out a couple things you think you need to improve on based on this video. And maybe we'll do a one on one chat um, on that video. Right. So it's just you and the athlete as opposed to them in their peer group, which with the girls, you know, they they, they might struggle a little bit um you know being coached on their weaknesses in front of everybody else anyway i've talked too much enjoy have fun no i'm just kidding go ahead wally i just wanted to ask dominic a question because kim is definitely way ahead of all of us in this regard and dominic you've brought up the use of video with your pro teams and your experience with uh, breaking up into units uh, how radical is what kim mentioned to you relative to going back to the pros and the pro game? Well, in regards to, and I agree with her just quickly on the, on the girls, I, I, in my experience and just with my daughters, it's like, if you were to ask them all what their mistakes were, 
I think even if they didn't see a mistake that they were making, making, they would probably think, I better show a mistake that I'm making because I don't want to seem seem like I'm, you know, I, I don't want to seem like I don't make any mistakes. Like so, they would from that from that side. Um, on the on the pro side, uh, in regards to like it. it with my experience is that we've kind of had to go the like the other way it's almost the other way and i know tim had had sent a great resource in a book and as far as confidence it's like um like you've got and again it's tough because you we can't we won't show uh like if we show negative clips in front of the group like all of a sudden it's like these guys are, these guys take this huge hit right and then and so i think i'd mentioned prior the only like in talking with guys and we're showing group video they're like the only thing i'm watching for is if i'm if i'm making a mistake if, if it's me on the clip if i'm not on the clip then i relax and I, I don't even really pay attention to what's going on um so you know but there is an element that we have to hold like there has to be some bit of accountability and, and we only did it a couple times. Um, and, you know, like, you know, as, as Kim had mentioned, <clears throat> criticized in private. And um, so we've, I've, I've seen that and it, and you would think like your oldest guy, your most veteran guy would be, you know, desensitized to the point where it didn't matter. And I've seen veteran guys, captains for multiple years, and the coach will make a comment, just an off the cuff comment about, let's say, you know, his ability, his skill. And like the player, like, the player is rattled. Like he won't show it like externally. So I, I think there has to be an accountability side. And we've done that in times. We did it like twice last year uh, where it was an inference of, you know, responsibility and everybody kind of knew who it was but we didn't really single them out per se uh and i mean literally twice and and you know and and again it seemed to work and i guess quote unquote work and I, and after we reflected upon it we thought to ourselves well we shouldn't have to cattle prod these guys right to get a res to get a re to get a result so um i don't know that's a little bit of deviation there from the from what my thoughts but yeah that's i hope that helps a little bit go ahead al yeah so i just hearing some of this i mean i i don't think anybody of any age likes being criticized directly right um i know when you kind of get your back up a little bit and um uh, with the younger kids their eyes glaze over so when we use the video we you know if i'm showing them something on the ipad you point out something really good that a kid did and you just see his chest puff out right he gets you know he's proud of what he did he's glad that he saw it and but we do create an environment in inner practices and on the bench during games of like kind of a learning environment right where it's you know if we're on the ice uh when we set a drill up it'll be something like all right well everybody's going to make a mistake if you lose the puck that's all right um joe quinn from power edge pro had a great uh comment for the kids whenever he came down it was like well everybody's going to lose the puck and we call that puck recovery training you know so that'll make you better at recovering loose pucks if you lose the puck just go after it and get it right so so the kids don't seem to when you explain it like that they don't seem to mind if they make a mistake and they lose the puck during the drill it's kind of like okay well that's how i'm going to train recovering a loose puck but um but on the bench like you know again we'll we'll ask them like between even between shifts like all right well, what what'd you guys do really good out there and what would you do different and when you pose it that way, it's almost like they don't mind saying, well, I could have done this or I could. Yeah, I could have done that, too. And, and that kind of thing. So we'll do that on the magnet boards, too, where we've set up, you know, we see something where, you know, everybody was because you see it with the little kids, they'll all come over to the same side of the ice where the puck was. So we'll set up the magnet board like that with their, you know, where their guys were and where our guys were and say, all right, how does that look to you? And, what would you where do you think those guys should be? And then they'll start moving the magnets around. And it's not it's not like a direct thing directed at any one kid or directed negatively at the kids but it gives them the sense of like okay well this is you know this looks a lot better and then well what if i went and did this and what if you went and did that and they'll have a little chat over that so that's uh 
I don't know. That's my take on it. And same thing with the video sessions afterwards. Like I think you could almost do that too. Like they know, they know what they did wrong. Yeah, I, um, I'm. <clears throat> I, I first off, I, I really like uh, um, you know the response Kim there about using the opposition's errors to help um, you know cover some teaching points. Uh, in fact, you you may recall like. I, we just did just do that once uh, on my last trip over to Denmark where we used another team's uh, penalty killing to try to drive home a point that we've been trying to make with our girls that we kept failing at. And I, I think that's a, I think that's a really useful way uh, to get at some of those sort of repeated errors, especially if you can marry them up. Like if you're having trouble in a particular situation offensively or for checking or whatever it is if you can find the clip whether it's an nhl clip or your opponent breaking down and then asking the girls uh, or guys um, you know what where's the error here or what's the problem with the opposition the way they handled it that's a that's a really good uh, suggestion and something we sort of moved towards but it it's now in my brain now i'm gonna be working around that. Um, so I just wanted to follow up on this whole idea because I, I, you know, I agree with what Al just said that as players, we we definitely uh, a couple of things. We we all know uh, lots of times when we screwed up. Um, we also, generally speaking, don't like to be criticized. Totally get that. Um, but if you're a real a shark of any description you want to learn from your errors that's why i'm on here every week for five hours trying to learn how to recover from all my errors in coaching but um so it's sort of back to the video thing i i, I do um um i'm still playing with the idea of uh you know because uh the clips we show are generally positive and are really positive so if you've got a really positive team clip, but there happens to be a little error in it, um, can we encourage, again, I, I've certainly heard from Kim, can we encourage the girls to uh, ask a question about an error if, if you made one? Uh, does it help them become uh, more comfortable discussing and or learning from their errors? Because I totally agree that uh, really the positive clips are the way to go, but I'm just trying to, again, see if there's a halfway measure there somewhere. So sometimes there are errors and sometimes there are omissions. And uh, when I teach uh, novices, like for the recover a puck in the corner and, uh, and they go back half speed and don't, don't shoulder check, I, I call them in and say, what happened there? And, oh, I forgot the shoulder check. And, uh, and why do you shoulder check? Well, you got to see where you're, the, the answer, and they know it, is we have to see where our support is and where our, uh, where our uh, pressure is. And, and, and why do you go back full speed? Well, it gives you more time and space. And what's that mean? And they explain that. And all of a sudden, it becomes part of uh, future teaching uh, skills for them. And uh, they don't mind that at all because if there's no accountability, there's, there's very little learning. And you're, the way you hold your accountability is in a – in a positive way, but in, in a firm way as well. And, and they know they're trying to develop championship habits and they're not going to get there easy. There's got to be some some roughness and some sandpaper along the way. Yeah, re totally agree, Alan. Go ahead, Dave. Love what Alan just said there. That's that's the, the, the coaching them with the, the kind of the guardrails when you're asking those why questions. And you know what answer you get back, you can ask another inquisitive question. Um, I found when I was teaching, uh, or sorry, coaching girls hockey, uh, for the two years I did it, so I don't have your experience. A lot of it was around understanding where your team was in kind of their cultural development. So if you're trying to build a learning culture, um, if you're trying to instill a, a continuous improvement kind of environment for them, when you're initially in there as a coach, I don't think you have, you instilled that yet and you don't have their trust so i think you have to be a lot more positive on the video stuff and then as you start to change the culture of your team and you get a sense for them being much more receptive to a little bit more 
constructive, critical video, then you try to integrate that into some of the positive stuff as well. But you really have, in my opinion, you really have to have a sense for the feel of where your team is in their confidence level and then understanding on every team there are certain players that you can be a little harder on and you can maybe show negative video on them because they're more resilient than some of the other players who, if you say one thing negative about them, they shut down for a month. Um, you just have to be aware of all that. And that's a lot to handle as a, a leader, but I mean, that's why we get paid all the big bucks, right? <laughs> I was just going to add one thing to that. It um, sometimes, if if you do, I do think there is some value to criticizing and or giving feedback that you know maybe isn't always super positive, like in live time. And I think if you were going to, yeah, it's not the right word, pick on a player or use a player as an example, I would give the player a heads up beforehand. So I've done that before, where I'll say, and I, I usually only pick on my my kids who think the team thinks they're untouchable. Like the player normally never makes any mistakes. So they think, oh, she's, she's so good. You know, one of our team Ontario kids or something like that. Right. So I'll say, okay, you know, Sally, just, you know, today, like, I'm going to, I'm going to show these clips of you and here's why I'm doing that. And so that they feel like, like I'm using that to make the team get better. The girls, of course, always want to sort of assimilate and it's all about team for them. You know, they're hurt and they're all they worry about is, Oh my God, I'm letting down the team. Like they don't care that their leg's about to fall off, right? Like it's all about the group. Um, so I, I would do that and, and give them that heads up uh, beforehand. And that seems to work uh, really, really well for them. But, it, you know, the, this video I've been doing this year because we can't even use our dressing room where I send it out to them and I send a three minute clip and then they give me back individual feedback um, based on that video has been really, really good in, in terms of what you're saying, Dave, like, if they if they haven't been exposed to a high performance culture where video is shown or any kind of culture, it could be one of the U9 kids. If they've never done video and been asked to give feedback or what did you do well, what did you not do well, I find it safer to do it um, where I send the video to them and they can take the time to watch it and give that feedback as opposed to, you know, the, kind of the old school way, I guess, of like, let's do it in the room and let's put it up for everyone to see at the same time. Um, so I found that that really powerful. I don't, I'd be interested for those of you who coach the girls, like showing them NHL clips, like because a it shows that the NHL guys aren't perfect, but but also it, they're just a higher level of skill. How do you guys find the girls respond? Because they for sure haven't watched the game or that clip before. Usually, I might have one or two girls that watch it, like watch the Sports Center highlights. How do you guys feel about showing the females? you know, the NHL, which is the best level in the world, that's, no one can argue that, and, and using those clips to teach. How do your players respond to that? So I, I, I was just, I was just typing in here, so I don't talk so much, but uh, I think everybody for sure knows, like our Danish girls eat it up, the NHL video. They have no issue with it at all. And, you know, going back to Team Canada days, back as far as 2004, they ate it up as well. Um, in a way, it's a it's a, a real compliment. I feel that hey, these guys are doing this. You can do this on the positive side, and here are the best players in the world making errors. They make errors, so that gives them a bit of permission to make errors as well. So, my experience is totally positive in terms of using NHL stuff uh, with the girls. I think you guys know that. I I would. I would say, because I, I know from from our standpoint, and again, this isn't with the girls, but this is from the boys, like I run the power play and I'll show a power play and they'll look at me like I'll show a Tampa power play where they go cross seam back door and the guys will look at me like, are you kidding me? Like kind of thing, like, why are you showing me that? You think like I'm not Stamkos, I'm not Kucherov, right? Um, and, you know, I, I think... I, I agree. It's Tim in regards to um, being able to show the clips to the girls gives them the respect to be able to say, hey, you know what? I, I, it, it feels great that you think that we can do this. I think it, in my opinion, I think it's a fine line because um, a lot of the things that they can do, there's maybe a handful of players that certain that in the world that could do it. So to be able to show that, is maybe at times could be discouraging 
So I think you got to be careful as to what you're showing. Um, you know, but I, I, I see your point and I agree with it in regards to showing things and it gives them that little extra boost where, oh, geez, I, I feel um, good that you think of me at this level. Just, I was just writing there, Dom. That's kind uh -huh. of interesting because it's the re reverse confidence thing. Like normally, uh, like in the confidence code book and everything else, it, it's the reverse where if the girl sees something like that, they they be might they should be thinking that oh I can't freaking do that but they don't uh, at least that's my experience and you would think that especially guys at your level with in the AHL they should be thinking no I can I can do that shit I can do that I'm a good that's, player like it's the reverse of of what we <clears throat> normally think it's very interesting yeah and really on that on that point just quickly that's the reason why some guys play like some guys don't. Like literally, that is the reason. Um, there's literally guys, there is buckets of guys that can play that would have the ability to play, but they don't have that little bit of, you know what, I can do that. That's like, I can look at Kutra and be like, I can do that, right? And that's the difference why certain guys play. Like Manjapani is a prime example of that. He's like, he's not that skilled, but he thinks he's as skilled as Sidney Crosby. And that's the difference, right? Like that's, that's the difference he plays and someone with more skill doesn't. And then confidence is a huge thing, right? And if you, as coaches, we need to instill that, and we certainly can't take it away from people. Yeah, that's really important. Yeah, and and I find we, and that's that's where, at least at our level, um, you know, where's the fine line between, uh, okay, you're never going to be more than this type of player in the NHL, and like we're really limiting certain guys. Like there's a, there's a, there's a player that we had that basically we told them, Oh no, you're not, you're no more in a fourth line. So we're going to play as a fourth line player. And then we ended up having injuries and everything else. And all of a sudden we started playing him in, in different roles. And now he's a point, he's a, he was a point, uh, point, a game player who just signed a, a two years. Someone else saw him and grabbed him in two years, one way deal. Right. And yet, we didn't want to give him the opportunity because we, quote unquote, limited him, him skill wise. So I think it's, especially with the games going, with the, with everyone having to be able to play, I think it's dangerous at our level to be able to say, okay, you're a role player, you're a fourth line guy. But as you say, it goes back to the admitting belief into that the players can do it. And I think it's you know, there's it's such a fine line between who's able to play up there and not because it is the whole package, but. Dominic is that's so good. Uh, like I try to do, instill that with the novice players or the younger I get them, and if they come up with a good answer around the in the classroom, I say, my goodness, that's a genius uh, answer, and and uh, you're so smart. And and by the time those kids are eight and nine and ten, they'll get up in front of adults and give a speech without without notes. And uh, I've seen it happen over and over again. But it's so important to believe in people and not only believe in people, but encourage people because the, as you, as we know, uh, uh, people will rise to the level of the expectations of the people they admire. And uh, that, that coach uh, player relationship is so, so important. And, and the fact that the, if they know that you care, if they know that you care, but more than just them as hockey players, it makes a huge difference as well. And some of the people that, have grown up without that, lack that confidence, and don't achieve tremendously like they could have had if they had had that that, that beginning. Yeah, I I really like that. Uh...